I invite you, if you would like, to grab your pew Bibles to follow along with our scripture reading this morning. If you can also find the Old Testament reading on the cover of your bulletin, we'll be, we're going to start with that in the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. Then we'll be turning to the book of Romans, chapter, eight, uh, chapter 15, verses 8 through 13. For that, you're going to have to open up your pew Bibles if you want to follow along. I'm making you work today. Sorry. Sorry, not sorry, as the kids say these days. Starting in the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, verse 1. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the lion and the fatted calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and a wean child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of, of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. Turning now to the book of Romans, chapter 15, verses 8 through 13. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again, it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come. Even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God indeed. Well, this morning we are continuing our Advent series, series we call O Come Emmanuel, a, ser a series title we made up all on our own. Uh, for, most of the ad for most of us, Advent is a season in which we get ready for Christmas. We prepare to celebrate Christmas Day. But in the history of the church, Advent has been its own unique season, focusing not on Christ's first coming, but looking beyond that, beyond the end of history, to Christ's second coming. As Fleming Rutledge explains, Advent differs from the other seasons in the Christian calendar in that it looks beyond history altogether, and awaits Jesus Christ coming again in glory to judge the living and the dead. For this series, we are working our way through the original text of the 8th century poem, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, to guide us through this Advent season. Today, we explore what you'll find in your hymnal as the second verse, O come, thou rod of Jesse free, thine own from Satan's tyranny. From depths of hell thy people save, and give them victory o'er the grave. The rod of Jesse is, is the King James translation for a shoot from Jesse's stump, as our scripture reading translates Isaiah 11.1. 1. Now, I don't know about you, but I've typically found that tree stumps aren't much good for pretty much anything other than sitting on them if it happens to have been cut nice and smooth and flat. And that is actually the very point of this passage. 
As we look into our text this morning, we will see that hope rises out of the dead stumps of our lives because of Jesus Christ. Would you take a moment to pray with me? Lord, as we come to the end of this Thanksgiving weekend, as we also celebrate this first Sunday in the season of Advent, many of us are finding ourselves, well, frankly, Lord, we're just worn out and tired. We love being with family, but it's also exhausting. And sometimes, Lord, life serves up its own helping of difficult. And we just find ourselves worn down. We kind of feel, Lord, like a dead tree stump with nothing left to offer. Lord, this morning, we come to you, to your word, to be refreshed and renewed at the well of your Holy Spirit. Would your spirit come and fill our hearts, open our eyes, unplug our ears, clear our minds, so we may see you a little bit more clearly and be filled with the life that only you have to offer. This morning, Lord, we would see Jesus and him only. It is in his name we pray. Amen. Well, many, many years ago, the summer before sixth grade, my family moved. It was a local move. It wasn't that big a deal, but it was enough to switch schools. And the new house that we moved into had an enormous front yard. It was huge, and it had this one particularly quirky feature. Down in the front corner of the yard, right down by the court, the sidewalk in the street, there was a giant dead tree stump. And it, it, was, it was huge. I'm pretty sure it was like, I was also, it was, I hadn't even gone into sixth grade yet, so I was a lot smaller then. So it might have been more like this big, it was still, it was, a, it was a good sized tree stump. The tree itself was long gone. I mean, it, it was gone years before we moved into that house. But based on the size of the stump, and, and it really was a good sized stump, it had to have been a really big tree. It must have been very impressive in its day. For many years, I found myself uh, cutting the grass around that stump and often wondered what that tree's story was. What kind of tree had it been? How tall was it? How much shade had it provided the cul-de-sac on which we lived? Why was it cut down? How long had it been just a rotting tree stump in our front yard? So, so very many questions. But mostly... Mostly that tree stump was just ugly and it was annoying having to get the mower around that and not being able to get all the grass right up against the tree. It was, and it was pretty much good for nothing other than getting in the way of whatever you were trying to do in the yard. Eventually my parents had the stump dug out. I don't know when it was, but in my memory one day there was a tree stump and the next day there wasn't and there was just grass. And that's not how that works, but that's how I remember it. Looking at the yard now, you'd never know there'd been a stump. There's barely even a little hill of grass where that tree used to be. And you certainly wouldn't know that once upon a time, there had been a tree standing proudly in that corner of the yard. And that's the driving metaphor that Isaiah is using throughout Isaiah chapters 9, 10, and 11. Beginning in Isaiah 9, he pronounces judgment on Israel for their unfaithfulness, centuries of unfaithfulness to the Lord, and that the glory and might of David's line of kings is compared throughout to a beautiful forest that has been cut down and reduced to dead stumps by the Assyrian army. Then in Isaiah 10, God's wrath turns from Israel to those very same Assyrians, the arrogant and presumptuous Assyrians who didn't realize that they were being used by God to cast judgment on Israel and instead thought it was their own power and might that allowed them to conquer Israel themselves. And so God does to the Assyrians the same thing. He uses the Babylonians to cut Assyria down, to cut their forest of might down to just dead tree stumps. 
good for nothing. And the only good, as we know, that can come from a dead tree stump is to dig it up and turn it into wood chips. That's all that's left. Unless, of course, you're talking about the Holy Spirit and the power of God. It doesn't matter how dead that stump might look. The Holy Spirit is in the business of bringing dead things back to life. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Elisha raised the widow's dead son to life in 2 Kings chapter 4. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Ezekiel saw a valley full of dead and dried bones come back to life in Ezekiel 37. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead in John 11. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Paul raised Eutychus from the dead in Acts 20. And of course, by the power of the Holy Spirit, God raised Jesus from the dead on Easter Sunday morning. God is in the business of bringing life out of what looks dead. It's what he does. So bringing a new shoot out of the cut off and dead stump of Jesse is not going to be a problem for God. John Calvin explains why Isaiah says the stump is from Jesse instead of from... Usually we talk about the line of David, right? So you would almost expect him to say the stump of David, but he doesn't. He goes all the way back to Jesse and Calvin explains why. We see, therefore, that to the wretched and almost ruined Jews, consolation was held out in the Messiah alone, and that their hope was held in suspense till he appeared. At the time of his appearance, there would have been no hope that the kingdom would be erected and restored if this promise had not been added. For the family of David appeared to be completely extinct. On this account, he does not call him David, but Jesse. Because the rank of that family had sunk so low that it appeared to be not a royal family, but that of a mean peasant, such as the family of Jesse was, when David was unexpectedly called to the government of the kingdom. So then, having sustained this calamity and lost its ancient renown, it is denominated by the prophet the family of Jesse, because that family had no superiority over any other. So, it is out of the dead stump of Jesse's line that the Messiah will come. Now, there are three defining aspects of the promise that's outlined in these verses from Isaiah 11. The first is that the Messiah will be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Isaiah proclaims, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. Now, in case there was any doubt, Jesus himself declares he is the fulfillment of this prophecy in Luke chapter 4. In fact, he reads these very words to the people at the synagogue that day, and he sits down, closes the scroll, and he says, This day, these words are fulfilled in your hearing. Because the Messiah is empowered by the Holy Spirit, Isaiah goes on to say that he will rule with perfect justice and righteousness. Instead of the chaotic and inconsistent rule of the Davidic kings, the Messiah, Jesus, shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips. He shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness, the belt of his loins. As a result of being empowered by the Holy Spirit and ruling with perfect justice and righteousness, the Messiah will be the one to bring true peace to the land. Isaiah proclaims the wolf shall dwell with the lamb. And the leopard shall lie down with the young goat and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together. And a little child shall lead them. The verses after that, 7, 8, and 9, continue to paint the picture of a world perfectly at peace, without fear, without threat. But the crux of this passage might actually be verse 10. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for all the people's of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. 
This Messiah, this shoot from Jesse's dead stump isn't just going to do all of this just for Israel, but for all of the nations of the earth, not just for the Jews, as Paul says in our New Testament reading, but for the Gentiles as well. And just in case you don't, for, don't remember, what's a Gentile? It's really simple, not a Jew. There's two people in the world for the Jews. You're either Jewish or you're Gentile. You're Jewish or not Jewish. You're in or you're out. That's everybody. And Paul says, except those people that are out, they're not out anymore. They get to be in as well, all because of Jesus. Jesus is empowered by the Holy Spirit to rule in perfect justice and righteousness in order for there to be true peace for all people throughout the entire world. Out of the dead stump of Jesse's line would come abundant life to every person on earth. I hear a lot of stories these days from folks who, as they talk, frankly, sound to me like they feel kind of like a dead stump. They feel like the tree at the end of the giving tree, that great Shel Silverstein story, right, of the tree that gives so much to the young man over the course of the young man's life. And finally, at the end, he's an old man. He comes to the tree and all the trees, all that's left of the tree is a stump. And he comes to the tree and the tree says, I'm sorry, I have nothing left to give you. I've given you all I have. And the man looks at the stump and says, I know. But what you have now is all I need. And he sits down on the stump. It's a great story. If you haven't read it, you really ought to. It's a great book. And a lot of people kind of feel like that. They've given everything they've had. They're pouring their lives out for others. And there's just nothing left. They're running on the ragged edge of burnout. They're feeling emotionally and perhaps probably even spiritually dead. There's just nothing left. Nothing but a stump in the ground that's barely good for anything at all. When we feel like we are worn out and used up, where are we to find hope? Well, when Jesus is our Messiah, the Holy Spirit gives life to what otherwise seems dead. Just as the Holy Spirit brought a shoot from Jesse's stump and empowered the Messiah, so also does the Holy Spirit give us life from what was dead. As Paul proclaims in Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. If you're feeling like you're at the end of your rope, that you've given everything you have, there's nothing left, that there's little to no life left in you, then turn to Jesus. It is only in him that we find true life, life, more and better life than we've ever dreamed of. Now it's important to pause here in this moment and note that often our definition of more and better life is a little bit different than Jesus's definition of more and better life. And I think that's a lot of where our struggle tends to come in. But when we submit to God and allow the Holy Spirit to work in and on our hearts, we find a depth of life that comes in the midst of the messiness and the challenges of life, not in spite of them. The Holy Spirit gives life to what otherwise seems dead when we submit our lives to the rule of the Messiah in our lives, which leads to bringing order out of the mess. In addition to being empowered by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will bring order out of the mess. We spend so much of our time and effort trying to bring order to our own lives, but I don't know about you. I find that all I seem to end up doing is, well, I just seem to keep making everything worse. As Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. Now, I'm sure most of us don't feel like the decisions we've made and that our pursuits have led to death, but have they really worked out for us the way that we thought they would or should? 
Have they actually brought us the joy, the life, the hope that we anticipated? More often than not, I don't think so. Just as the Messiah will bring order by ruling with righteousness and justice, so also will he bring order to the mess of our lives. When we submit our lives to his rule, when we realign our priorities with his, when we take off our own selfish desires for our lives and instead put on Christ, we find the order for which we crave. As we read in Colossians 3, If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Through the Holy Spirit, we find life from death and order out of the mess, which leads to finding peace out of the chaos. You see, when the Holy Spirit brings life out of death and order out of the mess, the Holy Spirit then brings us peace out of the chaos, which frankly is something that I think all of us could use just a little bit more of these days. It seems as if everything is just getting more and more chaotic every day. Just when we think we're getting a handle on this pandemic, what happens? A new variant pops up. What's this latest one? It's, it's Omicron, I think, right? Is that like a Decepticon? I think, right, from Transformers, Megatron and Omicron out to destroy the world. I think that's how that... And we don't even know what the deal is with this new variant, right? Nobody has any idea how bad it is. It might not be that bad at all, but it's a new variant, and therefore we have to panic. Shut down the airports. Now. Right? It's just crazy. It's crazy. Troubles with airlines, with the supply chain, rising gas prices, unstable politics. We are surrounded with chaos and we are yearning for peace. The peace the Holy Spirit brings comes in the midst of the chaos and the messiness of life, not in the absence of it. As we read in Philippians 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, if the Holy Spirit can bring life from that which was dead, if the Holy Spirit can, br can bring order out of the mess, then bringing us the peace of God in the midst of the chaos of life and our lives will be easy, even if, even when, we don't understand how it works. As far as Israel was concerned, their hopes of being saved by the Davidic dynasty were wiped out by the Assyrians. Nothing left but a forest of dead tree stumps. Often we find ourselves in the same place as in our lives. Just as God raised the Messiah, Jesus Christ, up from the stump of Jesse, when we accept Christ as Messiah and Lord, the Holy Spirit will bring life out of death, order out of the mess, and peace out of the chaos. May God bless each one of us this week as we find hope rising out of the dead stumps of our lives because of Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you please take a moment to pray with me? Lord God, it's amazing to think about what you are able to do. The power that your Holy Spirit brings into this world and so often, Lord, we ask for such small things. This morning, Lord, we ask for your spirit to fill us with your power, to bring order to our lives. Help us to submit to your rule for us, Lord, rather than trying to get you to go alongside our rule. And Lord, particularly this Advent season, would your Holy Spirit fill us with your peace, 
so that we can trust in you and not be anxious, not need to worry or fear, knowing we are in your hands and you are good. We could use a little bit more of that peace this season, Lord. As you fill us with that peace, may that peace be shared with those around us, our family, our friends, our co-workers, our classmates, who are also desperate for a little bit of peace and hope this Christmas season. We thank you, Lord God, for being our comfort, our hope, our joy, our life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.